It's good to see old colleagues again. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is some large time behaviors of water waves. Okay, so the question, basic question we want to understand is the following. Say, so suppose we have waves form in the middle of the ocean, right? And we want to understand what happens next. Okay, so I mean, this is a like wave I draw with hand. So that we usually typically see where air is above the water, and this is the water is below. Okay, and we assume that the density of the water is one, and the okay we neglect the movement of the air. So we assume the density of the air is zero. Okay, the reason we neglect the movement of the air is that we really want to understand from the really say, I mean, this is a really a fundamental question, right? If you understand what happens without air, you will understand what happens with air as well, okay? So, I mean, the next step will be to understand with air, okay? So we have water here, and this is interface we call sigma t, and we have gravity acting on it, okay? So the, and this is the basic assumptions we make. We assume that air density is zero, water density is one, and the water region is be below the air region. At time t, the water, the water region is omega t, and interface is sigma t, okay? So now we assume that water is inviscid, incompressible, er irrotational, okay? So again, this is a mathematical uh, idealization. So the water has very little viscosity, so it's uh, very, Accurate, it's quite, so we just neglect the viscosity, okay? And it's also a very small compressibility and we neglect the compressibility, so we assume it's incompressible. Now, irrotational is an uh, additional assumption, but we do know that if it is irrotational initially, it stays ir irrotational for all time. If there's no, so if there's no boundary effect, okay? And no external force, and this is true. Okay, and we also assume the surface tension zero. So again, the surface tension, so when we think about a large scale like in the middle of the ocean, the surface tension is also negligible. So we assume it's zero. So we want to understand in this situation what really happens, okay? Whether this is sufficient to interpret the phenomena we see, some of the phenomena we see, okay? Okay, so, so in, under these assumptions, the fluid is satisfies uh, Euler equation, okay, so this is coming from the Newton's law. The left hand side is the acceleration, right, V's, vasco with, uh, V's velocity, and the right hand side is a force term, and because we assume the density is one, so that's how it looks like inside domain. And this is incompressible, irrotational, and because we neglect the air, so the and surface tension, so the only force acting on the interface is the vacuum, right, which so the pressure is zero on the, on the interface. Okay, so now under these assumptions actually, so in particular without surface tension, we know that surface tension has stabilizing effect. Okay, so, and if surface tension is neglected, the, surf the motion can be subject to so-called Taylor instability. Okay, so the Taylor instability basically requires that, Taylor condition requires that Negative dp dn is strictly positive, so p is the pressure. Okay, so this n is the outward unit normal. Okay, of the interface. So this means that the pressure, the the Taylor sign condition requires that the pressure should be increasing inward. Okay, so if the pressure is decreasing, uh, so if it's it's decreasing inward, so that means that there's a force rip open the fluid, right, and the bubble will form, okay? So if the bubble form, and this problem will be, I mean, this, 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 the bubble form, the thing is unstable, or in other words, this, this equation is ill-posed, because, you know, initially we assume that the fluid domain is simply connected, and later on you have new boundary form inside, so it's, this formulation needs to be changed, right? Or in other words, this, post, the way posting in this way is not right, okay? Okay, and this is the so-called Taylor sign condition, right? So, what, so this guarantees there should be no bubble inside. So, now, how did I 
G.I. Taylor came up with this condition. So he basically calculated the negative DPDN along a flat interface, okay? And he linearized it. So if you linearize the equation and you just calculate this, and you find that if the water is above air, right, this is very unstable situation. So negative DPDN has to be less than zero, okay? So I mean, it's a, like elevator effect, okay? So it's unstable, and if the air is above water, and it's stable. Okay, so what do we know about it? Okay, so about the Taylor sun condition, actually we can prove this always holds for water wave motion. Okay, so in fact this is not assumption. So as long as the interface is non-self intersecting, and as a consequence we can show that if you start with an interface that's say smooth up to other five, okay, it, re it remains smooth for other five for a short period of time, but a positive period of time, okay. And the equation is solvable for this short period of time and has a unique solution, and the surface remains stable, okay. So now why this Taylor sign condition actually hold? It's not, what, I mean, even if the wave overturns, okay. So the Taylor sign condition holds is actually, I mean, once you, you feel this should, should be true, and it's not difficult to prove, okay? So the proof is simple. So you just, you just <coughs> apply divergence to both sides of this Euler equation. So divergence of the first term is zero, okay? So divergence of the second term, use curl equals zero, you get gradient V square. The right-hand side is negative Laplace P, right? And uh, so that's the equation we have. La Laplace P is negative, negative gradient V squared, which is less than or equal to zero. But we also know pressure is zero on the boundary, right? So this means that the pressure should be a function that is concave down, right? It's a superharmonic, subharmonic, I don't, I forgot, <laughs> I, I always get it <laughs> opposite. So anyway, using maximum principle, you get negative dependence positive, okay? So in fact, this is not surprising, in fact, for for people, I mean, for those people surf, they always know this is stable, okay? Even though for some, for mathematicians, it has taken a while to really understand. So even if the wave overturns like this, it is stable, okay? Why this is stable? If overturn, it doesn't, it's, things doesn't break, because why? Because for the surfer, I mean, how can you surf, right? You surf. You, the reason you can surf is because this part is smooth, otherwise you cannot surf, right? If the wave all splash down, you cannot surf. And they stand here, right? So, because they can surf, so it's stable, okay? So that's uh, all they, I mean, everybody knows it's stable, okay? So, uh, but of course, actually the proof is not difficult, okay? Once, once you know that needs to be proved, it can be proved, okay? It's not difficult. Okay, so, so we know that even if we have an initial wave smooth like that, it remains smooth for a while and then that's a behavior we will understand, okay? So in fact, so there are some early work, okay? So this, the, the importance of the Taylor sign condition was evident in the work of Bill, Tom, Lowen group. So where they linearize the equation, okay, say assume that you have a solution, okay? You linearize the equation along this solution. And they can prove that if the solution satisfies the Taylor sign condition, then the equation is linearly well posed. Or you can say you can solve the linear equation. Okay. And so, in fact, we, now we can prove it's always true, right? So, and we have uh, solvability for a short period of time for the nonlinear equation as well. So, there's a, this, this, these are the first two works on the uh, oil equation, but they assume that the data is small, okay, and in 2D, and also this is an uh, infinite depth, this is finite depth, and they can say if the solution, initial data is small, okay, it's a small wave, okay, and then it remains small for a short period of time, and you can solve for a short period of time. Okay, and depths, so this finite depth, the, the, the bottom has to be strictly away from the interface, okay. So it is still open question that what is the behavior at the beach, okay. So it's the interface and the bottom intersect, okay. So this is not, not known, okay. So it's an open question. Is okay. that a flat bottom or an arbitrary bottom? Arbitrary bottom, uh, the arbitrary smooth bottom, okay. So the bottom has to be, so the wave is here, okay and the bottom has to be here, okay. 
So this height is strictly positive, okay? Strictly positive. Okay, so. Okay, so this is a, this is a, this is a work, okay? And this is actually what we know, okay? So in fact, so now we actually know that we can solve for both two and the three dimensional water wave, okay? Both two and the three dimensional water wave. So not just two. So two dimension means that you have, you just look at, sim simplify the pro problem, right? You think one direction is constant, okay? Or you just think one cross section, okay? Three dimension is where we live, okay? So now this work has been extended for, to include additional effects, like there's a non-zero surface tension and there's a finite depth, okay? So this depth has to be strictly away from the interface, okay, bottom, and non-zero vorticity. Okay, but all these work in all these uh, under with these additional effects, the Taylor Sun condition doesn't hold automatically. So you have to assume it. So if you assume the Taylor Sun condition, then you can solve for a short period of time. Okay, so these are the people responsible these for this work. Okay, so now the focus our focus is what are some large time behaviors of water wave motion? motion okay, so this is. This is a photo I took in San Diego. So this is some of the behaviors we know, right? So large time behavior is those things we see, okay? So uh, you can see that most of the time it looks like the wave is nice and small and uh, it doesn't break, right? Remains small. But there are some wave breaking in front of us. In particular, looks like when the, there's the wave, the water is shallow, right? And this is like the one w water pushing out and then one part of the current goes in and then they push together and there's a seems something like forming, okay, and it's about to break, okay. And uh, this is something I, I find on the internet. This is a photo for the so-called rogue wave, okay. So this is like a huge wave. It's a, the legend is that some of ship couldn't come back, didn't come back, is because they met rogue wave in the middle of the ocean, okay? And the scary thing is that this can form, it seems it can form in a perfectly calm weather, okay? So, and it's also quite localized, so nearby the sailing ship has no danger, but this ship seems just to see this wave like 30 meters high, and this ship come back, okay? So it took the photo, <laughs> it, it took the photo, so I took the, <laughs> I took the, I, I mean, I copied from the internet. Okay, so the question is, if we negate the coast, bottom, wind, surface tension, okay, do waves that are initially small and smooth become large and singular at later time, okay? So this so-called rogue wave, so this so-called rogue wave is, I mean, there's a lot of conjectures about it, right? So because, because certain ship didn't come back and uh, also it looks like where the ship disappears nearby, their sailing ship has absolutely no difficulty. So the, when you talk about rogue wave, you don't think about storm, right? If it's a storm, you can forecast it. But if it's not due to weather, where does it come from, okay? So why certain ship disappears, certain other ship nearby is all fine, okay? So, and of course, nowadays there's a satellite, right? They, they can detect on certain part of the ocean, rogue wave appears more often than other, okay? So there are some conjectures like say it's due to the coastal shape, okay? So the shape of the coast push the current together and uh, some wave become large, okay? And also the currents, the wind going this way and the current goes this way against each other and then some large wave form, okay? But still these are not all, right? There are certain cases that seems to really form in the part of the ocean where there's no, no, no wind is not so strong and it's, it's the coast seems to be also not so important, right? It doesn't form. It looks like it cannot be ruled out. So the first question we want to investigate is if we negate coast, bottom, wind, surface tension, do wave initially small and smooth become large and singular at later time, okay? Okay, so this is what we know. So that means we want to focus on small and smooth data, okay? So whether this become large or singular. So what we know is the following. So in fact, if the data is of size epsilon, and smooth, then we can actually solve the equation for exponential period of time. So this time period depends on how small is epsilon, 
Okay. The smaller the epsilon, the longer the time. C only depends on the profile. Okay. And the wave remains small and smooth for this time period and decays with rate 1 over square root t. Okay. Okay, so why we can solve for so long? Okay, so what is reason behind it? The reason behind it is that we actually find a quantity, okay, so y is the height of the wave, okay, so h is a Hilbert transform of the associate the, with the fruit region. So instead of considering the height, I mean, normally you consider height, you you consider this quantity is the projection of the height function into the space of holomorphic function in the air region. Okay. Now this quantity, and then you do further, you do a coordinate change. Okay. So instead of consider Eulerian or Lagrangian coordinates, you consider actually a combination of it. It's a uh, different. We, I mean, I don't have a description for it, but it's a very clean form. So in this appropriate coordinates, the equation become this form. This is a constant linear coefficient, and this is a, this is a cubic nonlinearity, okay? So, the, so this means that, what? So this means that, so we know that we only care about small waves, right? So if the wave is small, so that means this is a cubic, so cubically depend on the solution. If the solution is of size epsilon, so g will be of size epsilon to the cube, right? So this means that, in particular, the nonlinearity contains no quadratic term. So the quadratic nonlinearity should have size epsilon square. So this is bigger, right? So this means that the nonlinearity is smaller than we would have thought about in a typical nonlinear equation. So the water wave equation is more linear than we view it when we view it through the right quantities in the right coordinate system. That's why we can solve for so long. Okay. For 3D water wave, we got similar result, but for 3D, we can solve for longer time. Okay. So if the size of the data is epsilon, then we can solve for all time, and the wave remains small and smooth for all time decays with rate 1 over t. Okay. Now, for three, similarly, for 3D water wave, we also have coordinate change and the change of unknown that through this, the equation, the quadratic nonlinearity disappear. Okay, so that means equation is more, so more nonlinear, uh, so, sorry, more linear than we typically see. Okay, okay, so this I will not go through it. The idea is similar, right? You do the projection of the height function into space of, of Clifford analytic function in the space of the air region. Okay, and that's the equation we would get. Okay, okay, so now why is the the, the the missing of the quadratic term is so important. Okay, so typically, you if you linearize the water wave equation about the flat interface, that's what you get: a linear part plus nonlinear term. Okay, so we know the nonlinear term contains quadratic and higher order terms if you just do it straightforwardly, and the linear equation is globally well posed. Okay, so if it, if you just set the nonlinear term zero, okay, so the question for how long you can solve it is really the question of for how long the linear path remains dominant, right? Because if the nonlinear term disappears, we can solve for all time, okay? But that we know the nonlinear interaction can cause blow up, okay, of solutions. And we also know the linear path decays in 2D decays with rate 1 over square root t, in 3D decays like 1 over t, okay? Now the quadratic interaction is too strong that we can calculate. Okay. And for small solution, small solution, the highest order of the nonlinearity, that means the nonlinear effect is smaller. Okay. The smaller, the, the weaker the nonlinear interaction. Okay. So without quadratic terms, if you can change the equation, transform the equation into one contains no quadratic terms, you have an advantage. Okay. You can solve for longer. Okay, so this is just a heuristic argument. So this is like I just try to test what happens. So the different, this different type of nonlinearity, right? P plus one is order of non, the, the 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 order of the nonlinearity is P plus one, and you 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 have assume the decay rate, and you do the energy estimate. So essentially, we know that we can solve for as long as the energy remains finite. So this is the ODE you have to deal with. Okay, so this I will go through quickly because I don't think I have a lot of time left. Okay, so so this is uh, and this is ODE, and we will see that in order for the energy remains finite, 
we need this to be true. Okay, so this is basically needs to be bounded, right? So this is a time you can solve. So if n is two, two dimension, if p is one, then you are integrating one over square root t, right? So we cannot integrate it for, I mean, it will become very large if t become large. And this is size epsilon, okay, initial energy. Okay, so that's, so p equal to one is not good. If p equal to two, definitely you are integrating, if n is two, you are integrating one over t, so you can go exponential time, okay? So in 3D, if n is three and p is one, you can, you are, you have you are integrate one over t, you go exponential time. But if you have cubic nonlinearity, you are integrating one over one plus t squared. So definitely you get global. Okay. So in fact, we get better for three D than for two D. So this is something I want to emphasize because nowadays there are quite a few work following this work. Okay. So I want to see what's the difference, right? So in two D, and you can see there's a room in three D, right? In room to improve. So in fact, in two D, we need to assume that initial height of the wave is small. Okay. Initial slope of the wave is small, and then energy is small. But in three D, we only need to assume the slope is small. The height can be arbitrarily large. The energy can be infinitely large. Okay. So. And the reason is this is we have room for 3D here to manipulate, okay. Are you, are you excluding 2D solutions from your 3D solutions? That, that's a very good point. 2D and the 3D is different here. So here it's very important that the wave is localized. Okay, so that means that it tends to zero, and not so localized, it but tends to zero at infinity, okay. As time, I mean, the, as x, y go to infinity, it goes to, it's become flat. So 2D wave, it's not zero in one direction, right? So 2D is not included in 3D, okay? So in all the work, we need it because we don't want wave to come back, right? So no decay, so we, 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 we want wave to go out and then just go out, don't go back, okay? So this is, it's, it's actually, it's not known, say, for periodic case, whether this is true, right? In periodic case, wave will come back and you, and, probably never die, so we don't know for how long that you can have if the, you don't assume attending to zero at infinity, okay. Okay, so for 2D, we want initial height is small, right? But this is a little bit counterintuitive, right? I, in, intuitive, because we know that we should only assume slope small, right? Height should be irrelevant, okay? The slope is small should guarantee the wave uh, remains small for all time, but the height should be, I mean, it's not important. But this hasn't been removed, okay? So can we remove the smallness assumption on the height energy in the 2D case? So this is Jan Bachman, my former student, and this is my postdoc, so we are investigating this. So in fact, Jen has, in her thesis, she studied the uh, linear water wave equation, and this is actually, so for the water wave equation, this is a dispersive equation, right? For this equation, we know that the dispersion relation tells us that the small frequency wave actually moves out to infinity, but the large frequency remains, okay? So it looks like, it seems that the small frequency wave is our enemy, because when it moves out, it makes uh, the decay rate bad at infinity, or you can say the wave become large at infinity. We do want the wave to be localized, okay? So decay at infinity. So this is, uh, so this is where it leads to all these related work. So in 3D, Jermaine Masmoudi Shatat studied using a different method, space-time resonance method, where they actually come up with similar result, but with a small and a smooth, different class of small smooth initial data. In particular, they assume the initial height is small and the energy is small. But they also require that the, there's not a lot of small frequencies in the initial data, okay? So in other words, if you integrate the, is a, or you can say velocity potential also has to be localized, which is a quite strong assumption, okay? And uh, so this is 2D, or 3D, okay? So we know 3D is better because it decays faster, okay? The result is better. And in this work, this is very recent, and the almost global result, almost global well post result, uh, our almost global well post result is extended to global by just, they study further, these two works, they study further the 
behavior of the, the nature of the cubic nonlinearity in the equation. So they can actually find that cubic nonlinearity is not causing trouble, and they actually can prove global existence. So for others at the law, they obtained the global existence for a similar data like what I, we got. And UNESCO Pusateri, using a different method, actually is a space-time resonance method, they require the, the data satisfied additional moment condition. So that means they require, there's not, not too many small frequency waves present in the small data. Okay, so it's, the data is more restrictive than Arazada law. Okay, so this is an even more recent result. They studies, uh, they obtained the almost global well poisons for 2D water wave, but also a different class of initial data from me, from ours. So where they actually require the velocity potential, that means the antiderivatives of the velocity is localized. So this is a quite restrictive assumption, but the difference is they use the energy method. Okay, so requires the data satisfy additional moment condition. Okay, so but whether they have tried the best, it's not clear, right? And I st do I still have time? No, no time. Uh, two, two minutes? Oh, two, mi <laughs> two minutes. So these are so some other aspects. So maybe two minutes, let me just say something actually because uh, so this is, uh, maybe I just close. Okay, so this is one typical type of wave we see in the, in the middle of ocean, right? Uh, okay. But this is actually not included in any previous work, right? Because in any previous work, the wave we assume smooth, okay? Initial data smooth. This is, looks like there's something going on, right? So what we can understand now is for this type, just by understanding self-similar type of solutions, we find that, okay, so assuming, so we want to understand whether this is driven by uh, uh, convection, okay? So in fact, searching for self-similar
much? I don't know. So, so because this is a different question, right? So this is like, uh, you know, mathematicians, uh, this is only this much tool you have. So you, you, can, you basically want to understand whether the linear part remains dominant, right? So we can prove it. It's an easier part. So you, you prove it remains dominant. So whether it can happen, I think that <coughs> there are certain things can be explored, say, outside the region we are thinking about. But uh, my, my focus actually is currently is on this type of wave, right? This type of wave, you cannot say this is blow up because it persists, right? It, it just stays like that, okay? So how to understand this? So at least, so this means you have to look at the data class in the right data class, right? And it persists, and maybe this even persists for all time, okay? Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker and... Uh So we meet back in 12 minutes at 9.45.